I didn't eat like for two days or something. So I'm going, oh, well, you know, I'll get a free meal. So I'm eating this fucking breakfast. I'm halfway through. I'm reading the coupon. Here it says, good between 5 and 11 a.m. It's like 11.30. I'm halfway through. Then I felt sick. Coupon ain't no fucking good. So I'm, I try to eat this, you know, half-ass eat this breakfast and then discreetly leave, you know, or something. I got away with it. I left the place. Nobody tried to catch me. Anyway, I find this casino downtown, 25 cent blackjack, 25 cent craps, 10 cent roulette. I mean a real rundown, pigsty, last resort gambling casino downtown in a bad section of Vegas. Just complete where bums hang out, sleep on the you know, low life casino. So I walk in there, it's 200 degrees outside. I'm depressed, I'm broke, walk in. It's fucking hot in there. The only casino in Vegas with no air conditioning. Hotter than a motherfucker. So I'm looking around, it says 25 cent blackjack. I got 80 cents on me. Here's this fucking fat lady sitting there, the dealer. Huge fat lady, right? With flies on her face. <laughs> in a casino, which, there's not a fly in all Las Vegas. You'd have to, if they give you a million dollars, find me a fly in one week. You wouldn't find one. This casino had flies in it. She had them on her face. It wasn't like a mask of them. But she had a courtesy, four or five flies stuck to her head. She's sitting there and, the, you know, she's sweating like a pig, her makeup's running, and she's, you know, sitting there like some kind of big dolly from the carnival waiting to fucking deal blackjack. Just a couple people in the place. So I pull up to the blackjack table, I put a quarter down, right? Me and her. That's a third of my life savings. I sit down there, and she had flies on her face. You know, she had, this ain't something you make up. Somebody had flies on their face, I remember it. She deals me a fucking hand, I remember to this day. Jack of spades, ace of spades, blackjack, right off the fucking bat. I go, oh man, 35 cents. <laughs> you know, big hit, right? So she pushes me my 35 cents. I get up, she says, aren't you even gonna tip me? I go, what? <laughs> Aren't you going to tip me? I go, are you kidding me? She said it like three, loud, so everybody in the place, you know, Aren't you even going to tip me? I go, fuck you, lady. <laughs> I put my coins in my pocket, I walked out of there, you know. As I'm leaving the door, I'm looking around, flies still stuck to her face. <laughs> the light's flashing, I'm going, if this ain't fucking Dante's Inferno, I don't know what it is. I remember going straight to the Western Union office, standing in line with like 150 other guys wiring home for a plane to get back to Cleveland. Yeah! Aye, aye, aye. Aye! Late at night now, drinking wine. A palpable darkness at the window. The hour is a blizzard of enclosure, of damping, concealment. The great wings are folded, and all around is quiet. But the wings have folded music within where I am. A frond of leaves nods, a porch light beyond. Outside, night rustles and rolls on forever, but inside the horses are still charging. Pink Flamingo. Richard wanted to get out of town for a week or ten days, hole up in some little place on the Jersey Shore and do some writing. So I gave him a ride down there, Friday. The season hasn't started yet, so we figured we'll find him a cheap, ro cheap room, no, no problem. Someone had mentioned Seabright, so we went there first. We drove the whole strip and didn't see a motel. But we were hungry, so we doubled back and found a place to eat. Before going in, we sat in the car and smoked a joint. Across the parking lot was a four-story steel skeleton holding motorboats in dry dock. Small white craft under blue tarps, like a knick-knack display. A guy on a forklift was wheeling around, lifting them down and then replacing them. I was thinking what a strange job he had, bringing down a boat whenever some rich couple came in, putting it in the water so they could float around in it for a while and then putting it back when they were done. He was like a librarian of boats. After lunch, we drove to the next town and failed again to find a motel, so we kept going. As we neared the end of the strip in the town after that, we decided to turn off the main road and wind through the back streets. 
The back streets were tree-lined and full of blossoms, and although we saw apartments for rent, there were no motels, cheap or otherwise. I said, this is crazy, isn't it? Anytime I drive through some out-of-the-way place, I see a cute little joint that I think, boy, I'd like to come here for a couple weeks in the off-season, hole up, and do some writing. Here we've driven through 50 miles of coast, through three towns, resort towns, and we can't find a motel. Next was Asbury Park. Richard said, let's get off the strip before we get to the end. There's got to be something here. We found a welfare, welfare hotel, and Richard went inside and talked to a couple guys who looked from where I was sitting as though they just happened to be sitting there, out of work, waiting for anyone to come in and ask them anything. Around the court, half the doors were open, and kids were spilling out. A young couple staggered from the dark of their room to the light of day, apparently involved in a secret discussion of something so specific that their secret would have been safe in headlines. Richard came out. What's the deal, I said. Uh, they, they, they said they thought it would be 200 a week. We looked around the place, he from beside the car, I from inside it. A guy allowed a beer bottle into the empty pool. Richard got into the car. We decided without saying so that the seediness of this place would be more a distraction than an asset. Let's see what else we can find, he said. Up the road, we passed a young couple splitting hairs with the quick, concealed gestures, all alone in the width of afternoon. On a parallel street, I spotted a big blue house, perched in tall command upon a short slope of tidy lawn. A sign said, Rooms. I said, There you go, perfect, and swung toward the curb. What's it called, he said. The Abundance, uh, Abunda Life. The Abunda Life Hotel. <laughs> what? The Abundalite, go check it out. Some kind of vitamin spa. Or, you know. <laughs> he was across the street and halfway up the slope when he noticed the third sign, Bible classes daily. <laughs> the, passenger door, the passenger door slammed him back inside. Bible classes, he was saying. What's the matter? Get in there. Just what I need. That's exactly what you need. Are you kidding? A little s spiritual direction? you come out of there a new man. Keep going, he said. Twenty minutes later, we were rolling up a street of white frame houses toward the beach. Elysian Hotel, Hotel Jockin, Dulcet Inn. I squeezed into a parking space. Richard went into one of them, and I opened a newspaper. Between articles, I caught sight of two gentlemen on a porch, a white mustached old ruby in a rocking chair, and a young guy in a leather jacket and a pink plastic earring. The young guy spotted someone across the street and stood up, called out, Hey, Gina, Gina, how about a bear? What? came a voice from beside me. I turned to see a strawberry blonde venturing into the street. She was barefoot. You want a beer? Yeah, she said, and approached carefully and chilly. She had the red, spongy face of a female alcoholic, and I must have caught her eye because she stopped in her tracks and tried to figure me out. Hi, she said. Hi. What are you doing? Reading the paper. Oh, yeah? What's new? Gina, come on up here. It's cold, she told him. Here, I'll give you my jacket. And she scampered past me up the wooden steps. Richard came back and leaned in the passenger window. What'd they say? 300 a week. Try another one. He crossed the street toward the Halcyon house. I glanced after him and went back to the paper. <laughs> Something ticked off the windshield. I lowered the paper. On the top step of the Valerian Hotel sat a fat man of about 30, staring straight ahead. <laughs> I went back to the paper. <laughs> Another tick, and then a skittering. Again, I lowered the paper and saw the fat man frowning in space. I raised the paper. Tick. <laughs> This time, I kept still a moment and then lowered the paper just enough to be able to see over it. He was peering into empty air as he slipped a hand into the pocket of his khaki shorts and came out with a bottle cap. He glanced once my way with the bottle cap poised between two fingers, snapped it to a skittering halt atop, atop, the, atop the hood of my car, and then returned his gaze to the street. I raised the paper and tried to concentrate. It seemed like Richard had been gone a long time. I turned toward the Halcyon House. Odd collection of 
odd collection of folks on the porch. He came back laughing and leaned to my window. I walk in the lobby, this big dark room with people slumped in couches and easy chairs, scratching their heads, muttering to themselves, and I stand at the desk and no one's there, so I'm waiting and uh, looking around the room, no one seems to notice me, and ten minutes go by, still no help, and there's a guy who's been circling the room, sort of grumbling and pulling his hair, so when he comes back, I pull, pull him over and say, hey, is this, uh, you know, someone working at the desk here? And he says, I don't know, I'm just looking for my insulin syringe. <laughs> Yeah, this is a peculiar place. <laughs> Try one more. <laughs> Five minutes later, he came out of the palmy arms and got into the car, laughing again. I folded the paper. How much? Four fifty. Four fifty. He said, there was a local paper on the desk with a story on the front page that said 450 more mental patients to be released unsupervised onto the streets. <laughs> local residents protest. That explains everything. I thought there was something about this place. Drive on. <laughs> Down the strip was a burst of bright pink. The pink flamingo. I swerved us into the lot. Pink flamingo, now we're getting somewhere. Richard went inside and I waited inside the car, convinced we'd found the perfect place. A sign at the curb announced free bathing. He came out and got into the car. Now what? Uh, he said 35 a night, probably 200 a week. Eureka! But the manager isn't here, and he's, he's the one you got to talk to about the weekly rates. Isn't here? Where is he at a time like this? He won't be here till tomorrow. Let's go a little further. Richard, this is the place. It's perfect. I'd love to go back to New York and tell Marlene that I dropped you off at the Pink Flamingo. <laughs> yeah, it's okay, but I want to see if we can find something a little cheaper. Aren't you forgetting something? What? Free bathing, Richard. You got to take that into account. <laughs> Not only that, he said, producing a pink business card. It read, Pink Flamingo, free bathing, centrally located, fireproof. <laughs> fireproof! <laughs> On top of everything else! A fireproof hotel, he said. I wonder if it's bulletproof, too. Of course, there was nowhere to go but down from there, and the afternoon petered out. In the town of Belmar, we found an old place that looked so fancy I advised him against going in. 105 a week. We carried his bags up to a comfortable room with a soft bed and a view of the ocean. Then we got back in the car so he could survey his new environs. There, there uh, didn't seem to be anything to eat in Belmar except pizza. Frankie's pizza, Johnny's pizza, Frankie and Johnny's Pizza. <laughs> the idea of wide ocean distance washed over the break wall and hung in the town like a blank mist. We didn't talk much. Suddenly aware that I was leaving him to himself, Richard said, well, this is some fix I've gotten myself into. He picked up a fifth of scotch and then a pizza from a place called Two Guys Named Frankie and One Guy Named Johnny. <laughs> I, I watched him up the stairs of the motel the fifth in one hand and the pizza box in the other, and then swung a U-turn. Driving back, I passed the pink flamingo, one spot of color in all that long stretch of be bleached towns, certain that the story should have ended there.
Ed says, I ain't talked to Jenny in like three days. Ed, why don't you forget her and try something wholesome, like a, I don't know, like a computer date or something. I tried that. What, recently? You tried a computer date? No, about ten years ago. At the time, it was like five dollars. They send you three names of girls and three phone numbers. You fill out a questionnaire. Yeah. So I figure I'm gonna get, I'm gonna be slick, you know. Instead of saying I like football, I'll put down I like fucking tennis. Instead of uh, you know going to the racetrack, I'll say I like to read classical books or whatever. This way, I meet a refined broad, someone that's not a dolt like me. Anyway, I got three names. One laughed it off and said, well, I don't need any dates. I'm beautiful. Me and my girlfriend did this for a lark. The second one was a wife of a Northfield jockey. Another one to blow off. I go, what the fuck? So finally, the last one, some little Jewish girl in Beechwood, right? Nowadays, I would never do this. I actually went to her house and her family, like her brother, father, mother, sitting at the couch waiting for me, like for the handsome prince to knock on the door. <laughs> You have nice hair. Thanks, brother. <laughs> now I realize they must have been totally scrutinizing me. Like, look at this. Who's this fucking guy I come from? I didn't even think about that. And how, how naive could I be? I was like 22. And I walk in there, and here she is, sitting on the chair, waiting for this blind date so they could all look at me. <laughs> now I wouldn't do it in a million years. First thing I do, I put to the old fucking man in the mouth, I say, get the fuck out of here, you're not supposed to be here. And I said, hello sir, my name's Mr. You know, Mr. Pollock, you know, I worked on the waterfront a couple of years during the summer, I was in school, got a good grip, all that shit. And this girl, she's like five feet tall, not particularly fat, but just dumpy, thick glasses, about nine coats on. She looked like a penguin. Plus, a fucking scarf wrapped around her chin. She was in the house with this on, right? Hey, Marty? Marty, no, her name was Janice. She had brass. She had brass knuckles. Brass. And, uh, didn't say a word to me the whole time I was in the house. Didn't even say hello to me, just sat there. So, we get in the car, you know, I start talking to her a little bit. I go, aren't you hot? Because you could see, she had layers of clothing on. She goes, this is for protection. <laughs> and all the way to the show, never said a word. You know, I go, this is ridiculous. I felt like an asshole, you know. <laughs> we get to the show. We get to the show. We sat there for like a half hour. Asked her if she wanted anything. No, no. Tried to sneak my arm around her a little bit. You know, she moved away. Just sat there, staring at the screen. I go, holy fuck, what a personable broad this is. You know, I ain't no winner, but... So I'm sitting there, and, you know, I feel more and more like the worst asshole every minute. I'm like, well, I have an hour and a half. I don't, she don't say a word to me. Just sitting there frozen, like I'm going to touch her, you know. And I went to the bathroom. I'm watching my, washing my face, trying to get my wits together. You know, fuck this, man. I just... I just I, I just fucking, I went out of the you show and left. You should have married her. <laughs> just left there. She must have felt really stupid, you know. I, I can see her. You should have married her. Calling up sad, you know. The guy left me in the show. That had to be bad. But I'm sure that happened to her before it had to. No human being could, could have went out with her and not talked to her. Oh, God, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Maybe your thing was I didn't say it was Yeah! This is called spring signal. If one person hates you, it's enough. It's enough to go on. I got a blue Buick. I bought it with the odometer dead around 106,000 miles. Up here, they took my back seat and my hope. Tonight I left with my best friend and my girlfriend. I had to go. Fuck all expectations and leave your bones to the sensitive and be indulgent. Hey, shut up! Hey! I didn't hear that be quiet, man! The different kids trying to breathe. Shut up, you can't hear Robert! Do it again, start all over. Alright, spring signal. If one oh, person you Robert, shut up! Fuck you, drunken bastard.
Spring signal. If one person hates you, it's enough. It's enough to go on. I got a blue Buick. I bought it with the odometer dead around 106,000 miles. Up here, they took my back seat and my hope. Tonight, I left my best friend alone with my girlfriend. I had to go. Fuck all expectations and leave your bones to the sensitive, the indulgent. Meanwhile, we're gone. We're going. Back seat stacked with cases of transmission fluid. Rates of blue-white smoke along the road behind. Can opener, coffee, eyes on the road. Bones clatter into snow. Follow the line of spring, screaming the word dream. Gathering diesel, bits of plastic, and strands of magnetic tape in all the bare trees of Brooklyn. Baby, please, please, please don't say you like me. Hi. Yes? Hi. Do one more. Do one more. Right. It's another Ed story. He says, uh, I ever tell you that story about my mother, mother winning the lottery? Oh, yes. <laughs> he says, I ever tell you that story about my mother winning the lottery? Your mother? No. And may love that. <laughs> First lotto drawing they ever had, you know, the pick six. First week they ever had it. The pot was like a million dollars. And for five numbers out of six, nobody knew what it paid. It all depends on how many people get it, if, I, if anyone gets all six, all these different factors. So my mother tells me to pick her up a ticket. She gives me the numbers. She ends up hitting five out of six. I watch the drawing on TV. I figure, holy shit. Six out of six picks a, pays a million. Five out of six got to pay, I don't know, who knows? Ten grand, fifty grand. So I go back to the convenient where I got the ticket. Can't cash it till the next day. But they run it through the machine. It tells you what it pays. They got a computer, right? So the computer says five out of six pays $3,900. I was a little bit disappointed. But still, you know, my fucking mother, all these years working herself to the bone in these restaurants, taking care of the family while my own man's out drinking. This kind of thing never happens to her. She's going to be overwhelmed. <clears throat> I'm so happy for her, I decided I'm going to draw it out a little, build up the suspense, right? I call her up. She's all excited she even hit the fucking thing at all. she got no idea what it pays. So I said, Ma, I went to convenient. I found out what the ticket pays. Now, don't be disappointed. It pays $700. Right away, she's, oh, God, Eddie, is that true? $700? I can't believe it. <laughs> First thing she ever won in her life. I'm going, yeah, yeah, I hope you're not disappointed. Oh, no, I'm not disappointed. Okay, I'll talk to you tomorrow. I hung up the phone. I waited about 10 minutes. Call her back. I said, Ma, I lied. The ticket doesn't pay $700. She's, oh, doesn't it? I said, no, Ma, I'm sorry. The ticket doesn't pay $700. It pays $1,000. <laughs> She's like, what, 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 Eddie, please, nah. did, did it really pay $1,000? I go, yeah, one grand, even. Well, good night, I'll bring the ticket over tomorrow. Sure. Right. <laughs> so I hang up, wait about another 15 minutes, I call her back. Ma, I'm sorry, I really, the ticket doesn't pay $1,000. She's not, Eddie, cut it out. What does it pay? Just tell me, whatever it is. I said, okay, okay. You want to know? This is it now. Five out of six pays $1,500. By now, she's completely elated. She don't know what to think. She can hardly talk sense. I go, okay, Ma, I just wanted to set that straight before I go to bed here. I'm real happy for you. Talk to you in the morning. Good night. <laughs> Next time I called her, I told her 2100 Oh, man. By now, she was in tears. She was crying into the phone. This is the nicest thing that ever happened to me. This poor woman, you know. Here I'm betting two grand a week on football, giving it to these fucking bookies. I could just give it to her. It makes her that happy. You know, lousy 2,000 bucks makes her whole life worthwhile. She's asking if I need any money. This goes on all night. I keep calling her back as soon as I give her time for each new realization to sink in. Do you want to borrow a buck? <laughs> yeah, I do. You got one? He's scared of hell of me, man. All night I'm building this up. 
My mother's completely broken down. My sister's over there. Both of them are crying, holding one another. My mother's talking about how now she can pay off all her bills. All night I'm calling her back saying, Ma, sorry, I made a mistake. Did I say 2800 I meant to say 3200 Finally, I get her built up to 3900 She's completely fucking shattered. Just frazzled, elated. She's worn out, so I assure her. I swear to her. I swear to her that this is the last call. 3900 is the final amount. I love you. Good night. We love you, Mom. But. But we love you, Mom. Next, next day in the paper. Next day in the paper, they print the amount for five out of six. Thirty-nine dollars. <laughs> there's a little article. There's a little article about how the computers made a mistake. Thirty-nine bucks. My mother called me right away, trying to play it off. She's going, "Oh, that's okay, Eddie. At least I got something. There's always next week." Eddie, we gotta save you. I couldn't even talk to her. After all the Save Shut up for a minute! <laughs> after all the garbage she's been through with my old man, after all the disappointments me and Stan gave her, I gotta torture her into one more heartbreak. My fucking grandmother was right when I went to see her in the nursing home and I told her I got a new job. She looked up at me and said, Why you be bum? <laughs>
Spring is breathless and full of breath. Beyond our ruined balcony, the sky is stratified and widening over everything else. The dribbled moon hangs. I don't want to know. White and redundant metaphors grabbing at me like so many hands out of the walls of a Polanski movie. Like this, self-referring. Let me be. Set me free. Release me. To be caught in the moonlight. Because the blue of moonlight is just the beginning, like the pink in a white wall is just the beginning, right? I met her in a junkyard. She pulled me into the back of a big old Dodge, and the war began. One tall, skinny tree in the moon, out the back window. The sky washed like itself onto clouds, like the ghosts of sands. So what? I just absorbed her, rewrote it, and now she's walking around somewhere I can never touch, and I am howling at the moon, which is just another word for her, which is just another word for my fucking blood, which wants to fall from the sky for 40 days and 40 nights, while some grateful, humble, dimwit, lone survivor navigates it, a fool whose destiny will be the stuff of legend in the interminable future. I... from the airport to veils of greenery and, and gold. And I'm going to start it again. Driving back from the airport through veils of greenery and gold in the haze of summer's eve, spilling down around the curve and shifting up into fifth on the straights, driving fast and slotted from lane to lane, blown above Brooklyn's factory of the dead, a rolling sea of gravestones in the particled light of summer's eve. Another thought for my heart to think, Another of beauty's bewildering forms. Another secret future to treasure, like ice in the bank of melting possibilities. Another perfume, another debt. To the left, the checkered tanks of oil. To the right, above the distance, the flat gray-blue cutout of Manhattan's skyline in the sunlit haze. The banked blossoms go by quick, dying with the blossoms again. The past flying out behind like a diaphanous rag, the future inchoate inside him, the present a mere observation, flashed with spring. I. Diaphanous rag! Yes! <laughs> Back to philosophy! Sorry about that, you think? Not your tab, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read one more. You got it exactly right. This is another collaboration with Richard Hill. It's called The Rain People. All right, shut up for just one more minute here. Hey, thing will be shut over. up! I'm ready. Shut up! How do you hear Richard Hell? Yeah, that's what I wanted to How are you doing? Shit! Yeah. Oh, I'm mysterious circumstances. One nine hundred and The rain people. <laughs> the rain came. The rain came and I was kind of glad it did. Not only for the coolness of it, but finally for a change in the light. A break from that steady summer milk train and a change in sound, a sound higher and wider than the sound of a street for a change. The sound of water falling long and free and slow to find its way tripped up and fast through the leaves to the ground. It was tough in the apartment there, the two of us hashing it out, sinewy is what it was, where the street was wide and opposite. 
I think of that race that's invisible in the rain. How happy it makes them when it rains. But they're by nature so mournful that at their happiest they feel only glad to be allowed to go to sleep. Clean white linens, cool, luxuriously tired, too tired to bathe, glad to be isolated and have the air smell good. The rain people's height of ecstasy. And on the sunny days they dry and scatter like dust, tiny flakes that coalesce again in the walls of rain out among the cattails at the edge of the pond with quarter-sized funnels popping up in the water between them. It must be the cloudy darkness. I, I was glad for the chance to wear a jacket again. I gave the bottle's cap a spin and set the table straight, turned the light off with a sort of a hush, and went out for a walk among them. You've got to walk three or four blocks while they check you out to make sure you're potentially as transparent as they are meek and welcoming and unprejudiced. And then they make their presence felt, parting, streaming aside and fading behind, full of suggestions, hints, that are all in your mind of the beautiful rain you're the home to. Memories you're not quite sure of, of rain time, like forest islands packed with the whispering ghosts of dogs. It's intimate to have your ear whispered into it's intimate to have your skin rained on. When the wrong person does it, you know you're better off dead. And then my blood ran cold like a trickle down the spine.